So we're finishing up Ephesians today. Good for you guys. Good for you for sticking through with it. Uh, I know it's a discipline to read God's Word, but also the Spirit compels us to be reading His Word. God desires us to read His Word. Its Word is transformative in John 17, 17. Jesus prayed for us that we would be uh, sanctified by the truth. And then Jesus said, Your Word, Father, is truth. So that's God's will for us is to be conformed into the image of his son, sanctified, made holy, made set apart for him. And the word is his means for doing that. So good for you for sticking with the word and listening to the spirit. So today we see this continuing application of the uh, admonition back in chapter 5 and verse... um, 20, 21, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, Notice that, that this submission is an act of reverence. We can look at it as an act of worship when we submit to one another in the church. Paul goes on here then in verses uh, 1 through 9 to uh, give instructions to children and then to slaves, bond servants is the word that's uh, used there in my translation. Um, to, um, again, be submissive and yielding to one another. Like verse 8 here, it says, Master, uh, I'm sorry, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. So Paul's encouraging uh, both the, the slaves and the masters here to do good, and even if no one sees it, Uh, God will reward it. God sees it. There is never a good deed wasted. Uh, God sees them all. What's good? What is a good deed? Well, as I've been saying, uh, acting in accordance with what the Spirit has uh, said in His Word is good. Uh, Those deeds done by that instruction are good deeds by definition. I'd also say that... um, Back in Ephesians 2, verse 10, God said that, or the Bible says that God had prepared for us uh, works uh, in advance for us to do that we might be walking in them. So uh, what are good works? Good works are using your gifts for the good of others. Taking those gifts that God has distributed to the church and using them in service to the body. Those are good deeds And those good deeds are not going to be missed by God. That's our application, I think, one of them anyway, is don't give up doing good. You may grow weary. In fact, uh, you will grow weary doing good. You will grow discouraged. You'll start to wonder, is this doing any good? Uh, Does anyone see? Am I making a contribution at all? Uh, But rest assured, on this verse particularly, uh, Ephesians 6, 8, That whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. So brothers and sisters, uh, if you are uh, doing good and feel like no one's noticing, rest assured the Lord notices and you are storing up for yourself treasure in heaven uh, where he will reward you when you are presented before him. Like verse 9 as well says, masters, um, no, we're supposed to, um, masters, do the same to them. So after he's told the uh, bond servants to be submissive to the master, he says, master, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that is he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality in him. This is the essence of real justice the lack of partiality. We have a movement in the United States right now, and I think it's spreading around the world, this social justice movement, and sees different justice, justices, I guess we can see, for different groups of people. People who have been uh, historically oppressed in the past uh, deserve a certain kind of justice. Other people deserve a different kind of justice. Well, that is totally unbiblical. Biblical justice is impartial. It doesn't see color. It doesn't see economic status. It doesn't see national origin. So that's important to note that. 
And um, keep that in mind, that the Lord is going to judge both the master and the slave, the one at the top of the economic pyramid and the one at the bottom, impartially. Then, um, as we move into verses 10 and following, Paul makes it clear that the church is on the front line of a spiritual battle. When we're called to the church, when we're called to be members of Christ's body, we're not called to board a cruise ship. We're called to board a battleship and take up our battle stations because the church is on the front lines of this spiritual war. Verse 12, is Paul likens this to a, a, a cosmic battle with uh, angelic powers and authorities and rulers. This is a wrestling match. And he instructs the church, he says to, to us to stand in verse 14. Take your stand. You're going to have to take a stand at some point. Paul warns them of that. What does that stand look like? Well, on one hand, it's a theological stand, uh, asserting and believing that Jesus is God's son, God in the flesh, uh, Israel's Messiah, our Savior, that we have to take a theological stand at what, some point, and also a moral stand based on our theological stand, that we morally act a different way. We, live, we don't live by lies. We don't live like the world around us lives. We push back against that. Verse 18, prayer. Prayer is an important component of spiritual warfare. Paul says, pray at all times under all circumstances. He goes on to talk about praying for the church and then praying for Paul's effectiveness. And finally, in verse 21, he mentions a, a person here by the name of Tychicus. Uh, don't jump over these names. Sometimes it's easy at the end of Paul's uh, letters to just jump over the names and not pay attention. Tychicus is mentioned in a few places. But before I call, talk about Tychicus, let me drop back a little bit, talk about this relationship between master and slave. We don't have master and slave today uh, around here. We have workers and uh, we have employers and employees. Uh, but you do have people throughout the day that provide services to you. Um, you have uh, numbers of people, doctors and nurses. Uh, you have waiters, all kinds of service people that are in our society, in our culture that take care of us. Um, you need to go out of your way to be kind to people that are serving you. That's how you live out what Paul's talking about this relationship between masters and slaves. Be courteous to them. You know, someone once told me that uh, uh, they can tell a lot about a person by the way that they treat people that they don't have to be nice to. And what he had specifically in mind was uh, a waiter that was waiting on us. <coughs> but that's your opportunity to put into practice this submission, uh, this work of the Spirit in and through you in this master-slave relationship. Always treat those who serve you with patience and respect. Back to Tychicus here. He's mentioned several times. You know, Paul has a whole group of people. We know about Timothy and Titus, but there's, I think, about 70 people in Paul's life that I've counted up anyway who uh, are working with him and that he knows. Tychicus, uh, we see him in Acts chapter 20. He's identified as an Asian. I think that means he's probably coming uh, not from the Far East, but from Turkey. He's from that area there. In, in Ephesians here, he's talked about being beloved and faithful. He's called a minister, that is a servant of the church, and a brother of Paul. Similarly in Colossians, he's uh, sent by Paul from his Roman imprisonment to Colossae. You know, that was a thousand mile journey uh, in difficult situation, but he's sent to Colossae and he's called there again, a minister uh, that is a servant of the church, a brother, 
And Paul even calls him a fellow slave. In 2 Timothy 4, at the end of Paul's life, we see him sending Tychicus to Ephesus. Tychicus is with him in that final imprisonment. And then same in Titus 3.12, he's mentioned again uh, with Paul in that last imprisonment. So he's called a minister, a brother, a fellow servant. Tychicus is beloved and faithful. We need these kinds of people in the church. We need people like this. I pray that you're like this. I think this would be our uh, example here of a good example to follow, our application. Tychicus is a good example to follow. You know, in your church, uh, um, in your fellowship, among your people, are you known as a beloved person? Someone that everyone cares about and loves and admires? Are you known as a person who is faithful? Not just faithful to the Lord, but faithful to the people that are in your group, that are in your church. Are you a faithful servant, ready to use your gifts when they're needed? Are you a minister, a servant of the body? Are you at work uh, contributing to the body, both financially and with your energy through the use of your gifts? Would people call you a brother or a sister? Would they feel that closeness to you, that koinonia, that fellowship with you to call you that? And are you known as a slave to Jesus as you serve your church? Is that your reputation? Like I said, Tychicus is a good example for us to follow, something good to shoot for. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that both you and I are growing more and more like this more and more into this image of a faithful minister working tirelessly with the gifts that God's given them to do good for the body. May that be each of us. So I hope you have enjoyed uh, the book of Ephesians, not so much my comments, but your reading. I trust that the Lord has used this book of Ephesians in your life to give you greater appreciation of his church. Now, as we move to the book of Philippians, we're going to move to a book that's widely known as a book about joy. We'll see you tomorrow when we start the book of Philippians.